everyone and uh, welcome to today's webinar. Um, and to, my name is Marjan Farid. I am a, a professor of ophthalmology at the University of California, Irvine. And thank you so much for everyone joining from around the world. It's really a pleasure and honor to be with you today discussing ocular surface disease, ocular surface reconstruction for severe ocular surface disease. Uh, these are my financial disclosures, and I am going to jump right in. So first of all, let's sort of define what is severe ocular surface disease. Um, these are, uh, you know, ocular surfaces that I define with uh, limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, the most severe forms are those that have resulted from perhaps chemical or thermal injuries to the surface of the eye. Uh, certainly, uh, severe autoimmune, uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, for example, uh, these are the most severe forms that really result in significant conjunctival disease as well as corneal disease. Of course, patients who have aniridia, congenital aniridia, um, these patients long term will also have complete loss of their stem cell function, um, corneal stem cell function. Um, then there's other more overlooked causes of limbal stem cell deficiency. And, and I'll talk a little bit about those. Those include things like contact lens, overwear, um, severe atopic disease, uh, chronic use of topical toxic uh, preserved eye drops. For example, patients who have had long-term glaucoma and may have been on uh, glaucoma drops for years and been exposed to uh, preservatives. So usually with loss of stem cells, what we first see is that the architecture of the limbus is not clear. It becomes obscurated and those uh, palisades of void are gone. And the, that distinction between where the sclera ends and where the uh, cornea begins, that area of the limbus uh, develops some neovascularization and irregularity. Um, as the next stage, what we see is irregular fluorescein staining of the corneal surface. So you get this initially very column-like and then eventually very whorled epitheliopathy that can um, extend into the visual axis and actually be very visually uh, disruptive for, for the patient. Um, and usually what we see is either the inferior or superior limbus is affected earlier than the nasal or temporal limbus are. And then you can get conjunctivalization of the cornea. That limbal anatomy usually acts as a barrier from conjunctival epithelium encroaching onto the cornea, and that is lost. And then finally, we can have non-healing epithelial defects of the cornea, and then severe cicatrizing disease, uh, perhaps some blepharon uh, from the lids to the ocular surface. So some of the earlier causes, these are the overlooked causes of stem cell deficiency. Again, contact lens wear. I mentioned that chronic, usually soft contact lens related, where there's chronic uh, years of hypoxic uh, damage to the limbus. Um, uh, the conjunctiva is often injected. These patients come in very irritated um, and inflammation is very common. Um, these patients are often highly myopic, and uh, that's why they wear their contact lenses for so many hours. Uh, so uh, they hate to come out of their contact lenses, and, and that's usually the main treatment is to get these patients off of that uh, chronic insult to their limbus. Um, a scleral lens option for some of these patients is often better because it removes that uh, that hypoxia from the limbus, but it also improves their vision as it smooths out that irregular uh, astigmatism that has occurred from the irregular epithelium. The next is the over uh, the next overlooked cause of limbal stem cell de deficiency is chronic use of toxic topical drops such as preserved glaucoma drops um, or patients who may have had. Um, uh, longer than necessary exposure to, for example, trifluoridine, uh, which is an antiviral used for herpetic keratitis. Um, these patients, if they're 
you know, having that exposure for a long time will also um, develop limbal stem cell deficiency. Often their ocular surface looks very uh, irregular. They get uh, punctate keratitis. And again, that limbus can look injected and inflamed and uh, abnormal. Severe atopic disease or vernal disease, uh, for example, vernal keratoconjunctivitis, um, often involves years of inflammation to the limbal area, um, al allergic related, um, with um, you know the the sort of the lymph tissue around that limb is uh, being chronically inflamed. Eventually, that burns out that limbus as well and causes uh, limbal stem cell deficiency. Panis. Uh, these patients have a goblet cell loss as well and um, can have sequelae from that. Um, there are some systemic medications that can also result in long-term cicatrizing disease and limbal stem cell loss. One of those um, is this uh, drug dip dipilumab, which is used for atopic dermatitis and in long-term uses has shown um, to have uh, problems with limbal stem cell loss um, and uh, discontinuation of the medication is, is often necessary to stop the progression of the disease. So a lot of these earlier um, stem cell problems can often be misdiagnosed as herpetic keratitis um, because they're they cause in breakdown of the epithelium, recurrent ulcerations on the cornea, and um, you know, if the topical antivirals keep getting reintroduced, that actually exacerbates and worsens the problem. So my rule of thumb is if the epithelium does not heal after one to two weeks of topical antiviral uh, drops, you know, that's perhaps the diagnosis is incorrect and we need to think about something else. So the you know medical management of these cases is often just um, will improve the situation, removing that offending agent, whether it's contact lens or whether it's preserved uh, topical drops, um, taking these patients off of any drops that have preservatives, the benzal, uh, the BAK drops, um, switching patients who are on glaucoma drops to preservative free versions or perhaps even earlier laser or surgery to get these patients off of the uh, ocular surface toxicity. These patients are often um, inflamed. So when we test their tear film inflammation, their MMP9 testing is often positive uh, for inflammatory cytokines. So a short course of anti-inflammatory mild steroids or longer term immunomodulators on the ocular surface may actually help as well um, in terms of improving the tear film uh, quality. Um, other things, autologous serum drops or uh, PRP drops um, have been shown in a lot of ocular surface uh, diseases, including neurotrophic keratitis to um, help improve the epithelial healing time um, to sort of supply some of the growth factors to the ocular surface and around, uh, allow that epithelium to normalize. Um, and so I use this in all of these um, early stages of limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, there is a process of getting that autologous serum. So you have to have a phlebotomist working uh, with perhaps a compounding pharmacy. Some, some people can do it out of their office. Um, you have to have the centrifuge and be able to uh, produce a good sterile product. Um, amniotic membrane, uh, specifically fresh frozen amniotic membrane can also be helpful. Those I'll usually place on the ocular surface maybe for about a week. Uh, the self-retaining ones that come with a ring and can be placed in the office are usually very helpful for this purpose. Again, scleral contact lenses are also great. They create a microenvironment. Uh, for that ocular surface to heal over time, and they help with uh, certainly with visual acuity. Uh, vitamin A ointment um, can also be helpful uh, in um, patients who have you know severe uh, drying of that ocular surface. Uh, so then we move on to the surgical management. Um, in patients where we can't get that ocular surface and the limbal stem cells to heal with just medical management, um, we move to surgical um, options. 
and I look at the status of the other eye of the patient. If the other eye is good um, and has a healthy limbus and the disease is unilateral, then we are often able to take stem cells from the other eye and transplant them over. Um, we call that a conjunctival li uh, living, excuse me, a conjunctival limbal autograft. Um, it's nice to be able to use the patient's own tissue as uh, then the patient does not have to be immunosuppressed. But if both eyes are affected and both eyes are diseased, then we're looking at allograft tissue. And this can come from a cadaver, a keratolimbal allograft, or from a living related uh, uh, person. So uh, that's a conjunctival limbal allograft. And uh you know, if the patient has family or siblings, uh, they can be tissue matched and their tissue, if as long as that is healthy, can be used as well. Certainly allograft tissue, however, because it is vascularized tissue, will require systemic immunosuppression and very similar to um, solid organ transplantation. Uh, we use their uh, systemic immunosuppression protocol. I'll go over that in a few slides as well. And the patient's age and the severity of their disease uh, really determines the length of the systemic immunosuppression that's required. So patients who have less inflammation on the eye uh, may not need as long of an immunosuppression protocol. Um, patients who are older than the age of 70 also don't have as much of a robust uh, immune system, and often their immunosuppression can also be uh, um, shortened. Um, they they tend to do they they tend to not need as much systemic immunosuppression long term. A mitomycin related disease, and there's another cause of overlooked limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, we use mitomycin C for various uh, surgical procedures on the eye, including glaucoma surgeries. Uh, pterygium surgeries. Um, this picture is a patient who had a PRK done in one eye only, and uh, mitomycin was used during their PRK procedure. Um, I suspect the mitomycin C somehow uh, uh, escaped from the center of the cornea, and so the limbus got uh, higher exposure than it should have to the mitomycin C because within three months, the patient describes this sort of conjunctivalization onto the temporal and nasal aspect of his cornea. Uh, he thought it was pterygium. Um, this is not pterygium. It has no elastotic degeneration. This is uh, just very aggressive conjunctivalization because of the loss of limbal stem cell architecture in those areas. This patient had a normal uh, eye on the other side. His other eye had had LASIK with no mitomycin C use. And so what we were able to do was to take a segment of conjunctival limbal autograft from his other eye. And you can see we take conjunctiva, but we extend the dissection into the limbus and cornea by about one to two millimeters to get those limbal tissues. Um, we brought that over to the diseased eye. You can see initially we're taking off uh, the diseased conjunctiva that has encroached onto the cornea. And basically we used tissue glue and took that uh, autograft that we took from the other eye and placed it. Uh, we actually cut it in half. We took a piece, cut it in half and used it for both the temporal and the nasal side. And you can see here, uh, the two segments taken uh, on both sides. We were able to use a little bit of amniotic membrane as well to fill in some of the gaps, uh, but he did very, very well. No need for systemic immunosuppression as we used his own tissue. This is after one month. Uh, you can see the cornea stayed very nice and clear and stayed that way uh, long-term. He's now out a few years. So and there's, this is another case of a 61-year-old woman who came in. Uh, she had been wearing a contact lens for most of her life in her, or most of her adult life in her left eye only because she was a monovision patient, um, no history of contact lens wear in the right eye. And her vision had been worsening. She thought she had been developing a cataract. She came in for cataract evaluation. And when we looked at her ocular surface and stained with fluorescein, we saw this late 
pattern staining of irregular epithelium across her superior cornea that extended right into her visual axis. And this was this is classic limbal stem cell deficiency related in this eye to her contact lens overwear. Her other eye was healthy, had not had any contact lens uh, wear exposure. And so that was another case where we were able to take tissue from her other eye, a small piece transplanted over. And you can see that her cornea on this eye remained beautiful, nice and smooth uh, with uh, you know no, no further evidence of irregular epitheliopathy. Um, the other eye um, is as long as it is healthy and has not had exposure to contact lens wear or long-term exposure, um, we can certainly use that tissue uh, with uh, no long-term sequelae or issues to the donor eye. We take about, in this case, I took one segment about three clock hours from the superior limbus of her other eye. And uh, she did fine in both eyes. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit more now to the more severe forms of severe ocular surface disease. And um, I know that questions are coming up into the question and answer box. I will definitely address those uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the um, PowerPoint slides. So just hang on to those questions and we will certainly get to those. So now we're going to jump into, again, the more severe forms of this disease. Uh, these are, uh, you know, we usually stage these according to the degree, how much of the limbus is involved. If, if there's less than 50% of the limbus that's diseased or more. And we grade it also by how much inflammation is on the ocular surface. So for example, an aniridia patient will have 360 degrees of limbal stem cell uh, loss and uh, involvement, but they have no inflammation. Their eyes are nice and quiet. This is a congenital disease. And so um, they, they're graded as a stage 2A. Um, for the most severe forms, these are the ones that are very, very hot, inflamed, um, and a lot of the limbus is involved. These can be patients with severe alkali burns to the ocular surface, patients with severe Steven Johnson syndrome, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid patients uh, sort of present in this area with high inflammation as well. So depending on the degree of inflammation and the amount of limbus that's involved, we stage these because it really affects um, their prognosis and also the amount of stem cell tissue that needs to be transplanted. So again, uh, sources of donor stem cells, we talked about this, we can get it from the fellow eye, we can go to a cadaver, the cadaver will give us limbal tissue, corneal tissue, scleral tissue, we need the conjunctiva attached. So when I order these from our eye banks, I um, ask for uh, uh, cornea tissue with large scleral limb and the conjunctiva uh, needs to be attached. So um, that's important um, because oftentimes when these uh, donor corneas are harvested, the conjunctiva is cut off at the limbus. Those are not appropriate then for keratolimbal allograft tissue that we need here. We want the conjunctiva to be attached. Um, we can use living uh, related donor tissue. In those cases, we get limbus and conjunctiva. And certainly the future of this will Hopefully, uh, we will be able to go into ex vivo expansion of limbal stem cells uh, uh, where we can get tissue either from the patient's own tissue or cadaver and expand these uh, ex vivo and then explant, uh, you know, transplant those onto the eye. That is all in research phase at this point. So we talked about this again, systemic immunosuppression. So this is how I prepare my uh, cadaver, keratolimbal allograft tissue. We, again, we order these corneas with a large rim, conjunctiva attached. We uh, uh, take a trephination of the central 7.5 millimeter cornea. We remove that central donor. We take the limbus. Uh, we cut it to whatever size we need. Um, so usually if I'm transplanting 360 degrees of the limbus, I actually need two donor corneas from the same donor. 
um, because it re usually requires two and a half segments uh, to transplant the entire limbus as we move out a little bit. Uh, that tissue, uh, that limbal tissue then is uh, uh, lamellar dissected, uh, about one third, two third, we need about that one third of the anterior surface of that keratolimbal tissue. And then we can bring it to the eye. Uh, there's a very certain way we process that tissue. And I have a video to show that uh, where we trim the corneal edge so that the transition from the donor cornea to that host keratolimbal allograft tissue is very smooth and there's no step offs. Um, we don't want to create delins. And then we transplant 360 degrees. We want to make sure there's no gap areas. Um, usually if there are gap areas, that's where we see neovascularization occur uh, or um, irregular epithelium coming in again. So we really want to make sure there's no gap areas. Um, this is how we take conjunctival limbal allograft tissue, whether it's from the patient's other eye or from a living related donor. Um, we take usually two to three clock hours from the inferior and superior limbus um, of the donor eye. Again, we want to make sure that donor eye has a healthy limbus. Um, the, uh, the nice thing about using fresh tissue like this is that we get a lot more conjunctival, healthy conjunctiva as well. So uh, very good for cicatrizing diseases. Uh, that have lost their goblet, goblet cells, we're able to restore some of that through this allograft tissue. Uh, there is less risk of rejection than cadaveric tissue, especially if you can tissue match your donor, again, similar to kidney transplant patients. Um, you do get less stem cells with this type of tissue, but again, you do get more conjunctiva. Um, if there are multiple donors, usually siblings or have the closest donor uh, profile. And if there's multiple siblings, you can then again, tissue match and find the best match. Um, Dr. Ed Holland and his team, Dr. Uh, Albert Chong, they've done a lot of uh, publications and research in this area with a large cohort of patients that Dr. Uh, Ed Holland has done, looking at long-term outcomes of living related conjunctival limbal allograft patients compared to keratolimbal allograft donor uh, uh, for these patients. And, and the conjunctival limbal allograft uh, recipients have actually done much better than just pure keratolimbal allograft um, uh, recipients. And so it really helps to tissue match and to get that uh, um, additional conjunctiva for those patients. What about the most severe forms of these eyes? These are eyes, again, that have the highest inflammation, 360 degrees of uh, involvement, cicatrizing disease. These patients often need both uh, conjunctival limbal allograft, fresh from a donor, as well as uh, what we call the Cincinnati procedure. This is coined by Dr. Ed Holland because he's really pioneered this type of surgery um, where he fills in the gaps with uh, then cadaver tissue at the three and nine o'clock. So you can see the pink areas where uh, tissue is brought over from a living related donor. And then the three and nine o'clock is filled in with cadaver tissue. And again, 360 degrees of um uh, transplantation so that there's no gap areas. This type of pr this procedure in general really requires a ocular surface team. It's a team approach. There's the cornea surgeon, but often these patients' lids have involvement. Uh, there's ectropion, there's trichiasis, and lid irregularities from the uh, cicatrizing disease, and those need to be addressed as well. Uh, sometimes these patients have glaucoma, and certainly their glaucoma needs to be managed. And then because we put these patients on systemic immunosuppression, we also uh, use an internal medicine tr uh, transplant immunologist or a kidney transplant doctor who can help us manage the immunosuppression. And you can see here, the glaucoma is usually aggressively treated first, uh, then the lid uh, abnormalities are corrected as a second procedure. Um, sometimes mucous membrane grafts are required to restore uh, the um, inner lamella of the lids. 
Uh, and then the ocular surface inflammation is suppressed using topical and systemic immunosuppression. And finally, we do this uh, ocular surface transplantation, limbal stem cell transplantation. Um, and then as a final stage, if the patient requires for visual rehabilitation is when we use uh, you know, the corneal transplant tissue, or in some cases, uh, artificial cornea. Um, we find that if we are going to need artificial cornea transplantation, it's still better to restore a healthy ocular surface first with limbal stem cell uh, and ocular surface transplantation. Uh, they tend to do better and have uh, more long-term retention. So here's a patient of mine, 26 year old woman with severe Steven Johnson syndrome. Her acute disease had resolved. This is about one to two years out and you can see she has total conjunctivalization, severe cicatrizing disease. And so we were able to take her into surgery. We, we were able to get uh, her brother to be her donor. And uh, first, you know, removing this severe uh, fibrovascular tissue. And we were very nicely surprised to find that the cornea underneath was clear. Um, this is tissue from her brother. Again, a large segment, including a uh, limbal stem cell, as well as conjunctiva to restore her conjunctiva as most of her conjunctiva had cicatrized and was diseased. So we transplanted that to the uh, six and 12 o'clock limbus. And then we filled in the three and nine o'clock uh, areas with keratolimbal allograft tissue. And here's how we're preparing that. We do a lamellar dissection of this tissue. This is probably the most surgically challenging part of the case is to get a nice dissection of this keratolimbal allograft segment. Uh, we want it to be as thin as possible. And we also then trim the inside of the corneal uh, edge so that there's a smooth transition when we lay it down between that donor and the host cornea. And then you see we'll, we're putting in reinforcing sutures uh, between all uh, of these four uh, donor segments so that there's no gap areas. So 360 degrees of the limbus will be fully covered here. And you can see again, that's the before, that's the after picture immediately. Long-term, um, these actual segments really cosmetically uh, thin out and they, they look very, very good on the patient. Um, here's what she looks like at month four. I'm sorry, this is not the best picture, but you can appreciate her cornea is staying nice and clear. She is on systemic immunosuppression. Here's another patient of ours who had IgA, cicatricial pemphigoid. Pemphigoid patients are the most challenging ones. They tend to really, uh, I try to avoid surgery in these cases, um, but in her case, both of her eyes were completely um, being lost in terms of her visual acuity. She was losing her ability to take care of herself. And so uh, her systemic uh, immunosuppression uh, she was uh, getting IV IG with her dermatologist. Uh, her systemic disease was controlled well with uh, immunosuppression. And we were able to take tissue from her sister and cadaver again, do a 360 degree, what we call Cincinnati procedure. And you can see this is what she looked like a week after her transplant with 2040, with no need for further cornea transplantation once we removed all of that scar tissue from the surface. Her other eye, uh, and, and, and because she is immunosuppressed and still undergoing IVIG treatment, she has actually maintained a very stable ocular surface. Her other eye looks like this. And uh, so we're waiting on this. Again, I try to avoid touching these until I absolutely have to uh, with the pemphigoid patients because they tend to have uh, such a, a poor prognosis in general, but she's doing very, very well. She's now about two years out from surgery. So how successful are we? Uh, it really depends on the severity of the disease and the underlying inflammation. Again, lower inflammation eyes tend to do better. They have a higher rate of success. The most severe Steven Johnson patients, the pemphigoid patients tend to have the higher risk for long-term rejection. Um, certainly uh, indicators of success are vision and stability of the ocular surface, uh, the need for subsequent penetrating or lamellar keratoplasty. Uh, and there's greater success with longer duration of 
systemic immunosuppression. Dr. Holland and his team have really uh, shown that these patients do require long-term immunosuppression, very similar to kidney transplant patients. Um, often, if they're uh, taken off of their immunosuppression early, uh, within a year, these patients will reject. So it, it takes years of immunosuppression in most of these cases to maintain that stability. And our immunosuppression protocol is very similar to kidney transplant um, immunosuppression. So we start them on Prograf uh, or tacrolimus, uh, mycophenolate or Celsept, um, as well as prednisone orally. The oral prednisone is what we taper off the uh, most rapidly. So within about three months, we try to get these patients off of the prednisone um, and then maintain them on the tacrolimus and mycophenolate long-term. Um, these patients require frequent uh, blood level monitoring of their tacrolimus level. We monitor for uh, systemic toxicity. We monitor their kidney function tests and so on. So they're under close uh, monitoring throughout as long as they're on these medications. How safe are these medications? So um, this is very um, interesting because our population of patients that require these systemic immunosuppression are often healthy young patients. These are patients who may have had Steven Johnson and so on. And so Dr. Holland looked at his large cohort of patients and looked at for looked for systemic comorbidities. Um, and because these patients are a healthier group compared to, for example, kidney transplant patients who often have diabetes and many other comorbidities, uh, our patient population is healthier to begin with and they do better. Um, their their um, adverse events from the systemic toxicity is much, much less compared to other solid organ transplant patients. And again, we follow these patients in collaboration with renal transplant immunologists and uh, uh, older patients don't need as long of immunosuppression as younger patients. So in summary, visual rehabilitation in severe ocular surface disease requires a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we do tissue matching for living related donors when we can. Um, and success is really directly related to appropriate systemic immunosuppression, uh, which requires management with a transplant coordinator, uh, toxicity is uncommon in this group of patients. So, you know, I, I urge my cornea colleagues who see these type of patients uh, to not be afraid of the systemic immunosuppression. It's an area where ophthalmologists often don't want to go into that area. But really, if you have a collaborative institute or if you're part of a group that has somebody to help you manage the systemic immunosuppression, uh, it is certainly uh, doable. And then these patients have long-term success. I'm gonna jump into one final to uh, topic, and that's patients with severe symblepharon or recurrent symblepharon um, that can be partial or complete uh, adhesion of the palpebral conjunctiva to the bulbar conjunctiva. Uh, these can be from cicatrizing diseases as we just talked about, or perhaps from trauma-related uh, post pterygium surgery, sometimes we see these aggressive symblephron or fibroblastic scar tissue reform on the ocular surface. And they're very difficult to manage. Their recurrence is very, very high. And so traditionally just removing these uh, and leaving that area bare or placing amniotic membrane or conjunctival autograft, um, even oral or nasal mucosal uh, tissue has been described to reconstruct these areas, but recurrences still remain very, very high. Um, so what we um, have been doing is using keratolimbal allograft tissue, very similar to how we use it for limbal st stem cell transplant. Um, we find that this tissue really um, helps to uh, provide a robust tissue alternative. Um, uh, as a spacer. Um, it also provides healthy limbal and conjunctival stem cells. Um, we published uh, the results of our initial cohort uh, in the Cornea Journal back in 2015. Again, the tissue is prepared as we had described before. 
um, punch out the central 7.5 millimeters, take that corneoscleral limb, section that to whatever size is required, uh, do a posterior lamellar, uh, uh, lamellar dissection, and uh, we thin out that corneal edge and take that segment and place it on the ocular surface. So, uh, so we, we took a group of patients who had restrictive symblepharon due to trauma, and some of them had failed previous surgeries with spacers, amniotic membranes, mitomycin C, conjunctival autograft. And um, some of these were post-pterygium excision, where there was a severe recurrence of thick fibroblast tissue, symblephron that had occurred, causing restrictive uh, strabismus in some of these cases, and diplopia and primary gaze uh, with restrictive ability to move the eye uh, in, in various gazes of motion. So what we do is we take down the symblephron. Um, sometimes we have to isolate the muscle. Uh, and we basically trim that corneoscleral limb, that keratolimbal allograft, to, um, again, the size that we need. And we use tissue glue to then place those segments um, in the area where we remove the symblepharon. And um, these patients don't need to be immunosuppressed for uh, really, sometimes they don't need any systemic immunosuppression, just topical immunosuppression. We're not really looking for stem cells here. These patients have good stem cells. We really are looking for a robust tissue to um, act as a spacer. So this patient had a severe symblephron that kept recurring after she had had an orbital floor fracture. She had had multiple attempts at repair and this symblephron kept recurring. She had restriction to um, nasal duction. Um, and we put in three segments initially of keratolimbal allograft tissue. You can see that on day one. Um, that remained clear. She did have a little recurrence of her symblephron deep in her fornix to the edge of that last keratolimbal allograft. And we actually went in and put in a fourth segment deeper in that fornix. And uh, she was then completely happy. She had beautiful movement of her eyes in all gazes of motion. You can see cosmetically um, over a a few months, it looks very, very natural and clear. And so this has remained now completely, um, uh, you know, intact post-op year three or four that she is. Here's another patient. Um, she had had a motor vehicle accident with some severe symblephron superiorly. We were able to replace with a segment there, and she's now able to look down uh, and with no restriction. Here's another patient similar situation. You can see she had had lid surgery here and it developed um, restrictive symblephron. We were able to restore again that uh, uh, surface so that she's able to gaze down. This is one of those patients who had had ter several pterygium surgeries. And you can see this is not really so much a recurrence of his pterygium, but rather a thick band of symblephron tissue that's come over and he had restriction to lateral gaze. We were able to put two segments in and he has also stayed recurrence free after that. This is a patient with severe um, uh, uh, symblephron in multiple areas. We were able to take all of this down and place keratolimbal allografts in multiple areas across the ocular surface. He has full motion now as well. Here's another patient uh, again, severe inferior symblephron, we were able to replace with one large segment of keratolimbal allograft tissue here is at week one. And then by month two, you can see it looks very natural. And that uh, redness that occurs um, is actually the lymph tissue and the keratolimbal uh, allograft tissue, the lymph tissue that swells up and can develop sort of a purplish hue that settles down. That's not so much a sign of rejection. Uh, uh, but that goes away. Uh, but we do put them on topical immunosuppression. So these patients are on topical uh, steroids for long term. And our results with this is that the diplopian primary gaze resolved in all cases with full range of motion and no recurrences onto the keratolimbal allograft tissue itself. Uh, in some cases, there was a mild recurrence to the edge of that posterior keratolimbal allograft tissue. 
um, and subsequent placement of additional keratolimbal allograft segments resulted again in full range of motion. So uh, this keratolimbal allograft uh, tissue is a healthy, robust alternative for treatment of these uh, severe symblephron patients. It's a mechanical deterrent to the symblephron reformation and recurrence, and it does provide limbal, uh, healthy limbal and conjunctival stem cells as well, which I think contributes to the long-term health of the ocular surface there. Uh, and we were able to achieve anatomical and fu uh, functional success. And so with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention and for you uh, uh, sitting through that entire uh, lecture. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to our question and answer box and start uh, answering the questions. There was a question on what does uh, uh, BAK mean? BAK is benzalkonium chloride, which is a preservative used in many of the uh, earlier uh, topical drops. Uh, so it's a preservative. Um, MMP9 testing, uh, we have here in the United States this ability. MMP9 is matrix metalloproteinase 9, which is an inflammatory cytokine. We're able to have a point of care test uh, that we're able to use a little aliquot of the patient's tears and look for tear inflammation essentially in the office. So if the MMP9 testing is positive in the office, we know the patients have inflammatory tears. Um, the next question is how long do you continue the immunosuppression after repeat keratolimbal allograft in a 37 year old man with chemical burn? Uh, do I recommend Cincinnati protocol? Um, really, it depends on the amount of limbus that's involved in the disease. It depends on how much cicatrization of the disease there is. If you have done a keratolimbal allograft 360 degrees, um, again, you need immunosuppression for these patients. Long-term, probably in a 37-year-old, you're looking at several years, three to five years of immunosuppression. Um, but I monitor them. You, you have to monitor the systemic immunosuppression. They come in every few months. We check their uh, blood levels um, of tacrolimus. We're checking the ocular surface to make sure it's stable, um, that there isn't signs of rejection. If there's signs of rejection, we may need to increase the levels. Um, the tacrolimus levels really initially for the first six months, we're looking at levels between eight to 10 on blood levels. Um, over time, if, they're if their ocular surface looks stable, we're happy with blood levels of five to eight. Um, and so this is monitored constantly. Um, sometimes early on, these patients need blood draws every few weeks to, to make sure they're in that therapeutic dose. Uh, the next question is, why do you prefer superior and inferior limbal stem cell donor tissue and not temporal or nasal? when conducting living-related KLL. Uh, so uh, the superior and inferior limbus have more limbal stem cells in those areas. Um, that's a good question. Uh, also, anatomically, uh, they tend to heal better. Uh, from a cosmetic standpoint, it's better also to not take from the areas that are exposed uh, to the environment. Uh, the next question is, how do I split the donor tissue one-third, two-third? Uh, so I say one third, two third, ideally it's one third, two third. Oftentimes it's just splitting it uh, by half. So oftentimes it comes out 50, 50 in terms of dissecting that keratolimbal allograft tissue. We do our absolute best. Uh, usually you, you require a, a um, nice um, assistant to help you hold the donor tissue and with a uh, crescent blade, uh, create a 50% dissection, which is often uh, sufficient to get that nice thin tissue. So you need the side that has the limbal stem cells, right? So we use the top one third. Okay. The next question is, what do you do to living donors area when the graft has been taken? That's a great question. So if a large area of conjunctiva is taken from the living related donor, I will sometimes use some uh, tissue glue to sort of bring down the rest of their conjunctiva so they don't have a large area of opening. 
Um, but honestly, you can also just leave it open and they heal by secondary intention as well. So uh, you don't need to do too much after you remove the tissue from the living related donor. You don't need to do a lot of work on that eye. Um, you can sort of leave it open and it heals. The next question is, what is the suture material used? I often use 10 nylon. It's less inflammatory, I think, than vicryl suture. Um, vicryl suture, as you know, will uh, resorb on its own, but it's a little bit more inflammatory, and I really want to minimize inflammation to the surface, so I use 10 nylon. Uh, the next question is, what is the indication for stem cell transplant in aniridia patients? So aniridia patients are interesting because they often have decreased vision to begin with from macular hypoplasia. And so I look at what their baseline vision was. If Often they don't have great vision. Maybe their baseline vision is 2150. And so these patients are okay for years. It's not until, you know, later in life that they um, start having um, secondary uh, worsening of their vision from irregular epitheliopathy. So you can stain their ocular surface. They have 360 degrees of limbal stem cell uh, deficiency. That's just the nature of their congenital disease. And um, so when the ocular surface develops a significant epitheliopathy and their baseline vision drops, the patient often will tell you this is worse than my normal vision is. Um, that's that's the time really to go in and transplant those patients. Those patients often, if you take healthy living related donor, sibling or a parent that has healthy limbus and does not have aniridia, obviously, you take just two segments, transplant them over and do uh, some immunosuppression. Um, they do fine. They don't need 360 degrees. They don't have conjunctival disease. They don't need a lot of conjunctiva. They just need some healthy stem cells. Um, okay. So the drugs of choice, the question is, what is the drug of choice for immunosuppression? We talked about that. We use tacrolimus, Celsept, and prednisone to begin with systemically, and we get uh, taper the prednisone off early, uh, maintain on Celsept or uh, um, tacrolimus and mycophenolate. Okay. Um, the next question is, what is the treatment for dermoid cyst? That's sort of beyond the... Uh, topic today, but uh, dermoid cysts, uh, usually you can leave those alone unless they're amblyogenic, they're very large, uh, or they're causing a lot of irregular astigmatism. You can remove those. Usually there's enough stem cells on the patient's cornea. It doesn't really need to be reconstructed with a stem cell or allograft tissue. Uh, sometimes I'll just use amniotic membrane in the area where I've removed that, and uh, that is often sufficient. Um, so let's see, the next question is, do patients require prophylactic antibiotics postoperatively since they are on steroids and immunosuppressives? Uh, so I do use topical antibiotics, certainly for the ocular surface postoperatively. Uh, systemically, they are on, um, thank you for asking that, they are on back trim for a short term to prevent secondary uh, infections. They are also on an antiviral uh, for about the first six months to prevent secondary CMV infections as well. Um, this is exactly the protocol that kidney transplant uh, facilities use. Um, the next question is, do you cover the graft with conjunctiva in cases of symblepharon surgery? So remember, in, in the cases that I talked about with symblepharon surgery, uh, those keratolimbal limbal allograft segments have conjunctiva attached. We order the tissue from the eye bank uh, specifically to make sure conjunctiva is attached. So you don't need additional conjunctiva on top of that. Uh, they have conjunctiva, they have corneal epithelium, so you can just put those down. And then I just connect the patient's own conjunctiva to the edge of that keratolimbal limbal allograft to make sure there's no gap areas, and, and that's it. Is it possible to use keratolimbal allografts for Marenz ulcer patients? That's a very, very good question. I have not done that, but that is a very good idea and probably uh, will help with filling some of uh, that thinning 
uh, in the area uh, for Moren's ulcers. Um, yeah, that's a very good idea and, and can definitely be attempted. I look forward to hearing your experience if you do use that. Um, let's see, uh, what is your experience with insulin eye drops and non-healing corneal epithelial defects? Do you have experience with subconjunctival platelet-rich plasma in the treatment of severe dry eye? So again, a little bit off of our topic today, non-healing corneal epithelial defects uh, can have their own complete lecture. Um, I have not used insulin eye drops in those cases. I have used autologous serum. I have used plasma rich, um, platelet rich plasma PRP drops as well, which definitely help in those cases. We also have access to um, recombinant human growth factor here in the United States. So we've been using those in those cases where there's neurotrophic corneas involved. Um, I have not used subconjunctival PRP. I just use it in an eye drop form on the ocular surface, and that helps with severe dry eyes, certainly. Um, let me see. The next question is, um, are there specific genetic markers or mutations that are associated with increased susceptibility to ocular surface disease? Uh, I think there are. Um, there are really none right now that are readily that can be readily used. For example, um, we have seen patients who have worn contact lenses for a very short time where you would not expect a patient to develop limbal stem cell deficiency after only a few years of contact lens wear, but they have. And so is there some kind of genetic mutation in those patients where their limbus started out abnormal? I think there is. Have we isolated that yet? No, we haven't. The only ones we really know have congenital abnormalities are the aniridia patients who have that genetic mutation. Um, so that's a great question, but there aren't any at this point uh, markers that I know of. Um, the next question is, what is the measurement of the segments that we usually use for keratolimbal allografts? Uh, the measures really depends on how much we need. So if I'm doing a, uh, if I'm filling the three and nine o'clock regions uh, only, then I, I basically take one donor tissue, cut that keratolimbal allograft ring into two segments. And then I trim those segments so that it fills in my area of defect. So you, you sort of trim your segments to fill in the areas that you need. Um, Let's see. Any role in conjunctival fornix massage after thermal chemical eye burn? Uh, I'm not sure what a conjunctival fornix massage is. A lysis of symblepharon, certainly in the acute phase of a chemical or thermal eye burn. Um, you know, there's a whole acute protocol, certainly with washing out of the chemical injury. Sometimes symblepharon rings can be used to try to maintain that fornix open. Um, I like to use amniotic, uh, fresh frozen amniotic membrane self-retaining. It comes on a symblepharon ring anyways. So it has that dual purpose of keeping the fornix formed for us, as well as providing that amniotic tissue to the ocular surface in the acute phase um, to try to prevent some of that cicatrization that occurs. Uh, <clears throat> next question is if the living related, if the living donor site is left to heal by secondary intention, is there any role for mild steroids for faster healing and comfort? Yes, those patients certainly I put on a very short course of topical steroids as well as antibiotics. Absolutely. The next question is how much of conjunctival limbal tissue can we take before risking limbal stem cell loss to the donor? Uh, very good question. Um, so honestly, uh, we take easily six clock hours. So three from the superior, three from the inferior, as long as it's a healthy limbus, I, I make sure the donor is not a long-term contact lens user. 
Um, and as long as, again, they have a very healthy looking ocular surface, they do just fine. I, we have not had a single patient that we've pushed into stem cell failure. And if you ask Ed Holland, who's done many, many more than I have, uh, he, uh, he says the same thing, that they, they do very, very well. So we can take at least up to six hours, clock hours, uh, with no sub, you know, secondary issues to the donor. Uh, question is, which concentration of cyclosporin drops do I use as immunosuppressor and for how much time? Uh, cyclosporin drops are a great adjunct to their post-operative drops um, and uh, safe enough that uh, if the patient is tolerant to them, I'll keep those on long-term as well, um, in addition to topical steroids. I think the topical steroids are more effective, however. Uh, the next question is, can you briefly throw more light on how to rightly make diagnosis of an HSV keratitis? Again, that's its own lecture, uh, so I won't go into that in too much detail. Uh, but, uh, you know, certainly if you if you felt that there is a dendritic or HSV keratitis uh, and you've put patients on uh, topical antiviral drops, if they're not healing after two weeks, then we need something else. Um, I, I find oral antivirals very, very helpful in those cases, uh, but I, I'm very, very cautious about continuing topical antiviral drops for any longer than two weeks. After that, they become more toxic than helpful. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you again for your attention, uh, for being here today. And uh, on behalf of CyberSight, uh, we appreciate uh, you being here. I believe this lecture is recorded and will be placed on their uh, website as well for future reference. Thank you for your attention.